Hi, and thank you so much for having me. My name is Sille, I'm Danish, and I'm a behavioral designer, which hopefully by the end of this hour, you're going to have a bit of an insight on what that is. I'm originally from the Royal Danish Design School, but I have spent the past eight years developing um, experiments with behavioral researchers on how to change human behavior. And you mentioned nudging. I'm not going to talk that much about nudging today. We'll do more about that tomorrow in the workshop. But today, I'm going to talk a bit about how behavioral economics can be used when designing responsible gaming. Let me just start with introducing my team because the type of work I do, I can't do by myself. So I work with this awesome team of behavioral economic um, skilled people, psychologists and designers. What we do is that we create experiments for banks, pharmaceuticals, ministries, and we do TV experiments as well, all in Denmark. And then we lecture on behavioral design and how to create solutions on different arenas. That also means that I won't necessarily know the right words about casinos and about gambling, because I don't know a lot about that, but I know stuff about behavior. So I hope connecting those two are going to make sense in your world as well. But please stop me if I talk too fast, or stop me if I'm mumbling, or, you know, if you have questions or comments, please just raise your hand and we'll take it as a dialogue. But my journey kind of starts here, because this is what I aim for. I work to make life as easy as possible. And by saying this, I mean making it easy for us to follow our ambitions on an everyday basis. So, when it comes to all kinds of behavior, and also gaming behavior, it starts with defining that ambition. What is the ambitions of your customers, of your employees, of everybody involved in this industry? So, let me give you an example on what I can imagine the ambitions of the customers could be. It's probably to have a good time, first of all, and to get a new, exciting experience. And then, since we're here talking about responsible gaming, I'm pretty sure they have an ambition about staying within their budget as well, to some extent. That is being a responsible gamer. So, with that in mind, we can start working with human behavior. But what happens a lot of the time is that we choose a certain model to build our solutions around. And this human model is called the rational agent. This model and this human image has different qualities. He has well-defined goals meaning that he wakes up every morning with like 450 well-defined goals. And all day long, he maximizes his behavior to follow those goals. That might be to save money, to be healthy, to get on work in time, all of those different little goals that we build our everyday lives around. So this rational agent, he makes statistical risk assessments so he takes in data and knowledge all day long and he maximizes his behavior to reach those well-defined goals. That means that he's rational. So he makes all his choices based on knowledge, motivation, data, all types of information that he gets from his surroundings. And that's really great, because that means that this human being and this model is in a certain state of mind. He is in a cold state of mind. 
which is a state of mind that is knowledge-driven. So in this state of mind, we are always rational. So we always do really well research before we choose, and we behave in a certain way. So it's always behavior according to what we know is the right thing, and according to what our starting ambition was. That means that if this rational agent should any way, in any way um, conduct himself in a responsible way, it would just mean to just stop whenever he reaches his own budget. That would mean that he would just stop gambling once he starts losing. Or he would always just stop gambling before he get out of control or before he loses everything he has. So that's super good. Because this guy, he's just cold, calm, and collected all the time. But the reason why we're here is that if it was like that, that would mean that we would all win. Because you guys would have a long-lasting relationship with the customers. They would be super happy, happy, achieving their own ambitions every time they go into a casino or do online gambling, which would mean they would come back and be loyal, and the satisfaction would go up. There is a but, though, because the cold state of mind is not the only state of mind we have, and it's not the only state of mind that controls our behavior. Because the reason why we even have these situations to begin with, it's caused by this state of mind. It's when we are on a roll, and it's when we are being in the hot state of mind. This state of mind is driven by totally different mechanisms than the rational agent. It's driven by impulses, instincts, surroundings, and flaws in our human brains. What that means, I'm going to get into that a bit later. So, that's kind of the main challenge we're facing. And that's going to leave us feeling a little bit like this, because, okay, so now what? We're in a hot state of mind a lot of the time, but how do we deal with this? How, do we, how can we take that into consideration and still have an efficient business running? Well, we got to start by redefining that human model and that image on how human beings work. Because actually what is defined within behavioral economics and cognitive psychology is a totally different model. And that model, looks more like this. So this is the actual challenge that we are facing when we're talking about responsible gaming and behavior in all arenas, actually. Because the challenge is this. 80% of the time, we have conflicting goals. So we don't wake up every morning with well-defined goals that we maximize our behavior to follow all day long. We want to save money, but we also want to go on sales. We want to gamble, but we also want to stay within our budgets. We don't do risk ass assessments based on knowledge and data. We do them on instant impressions, which comes from our surroundings, from our pack mentality, um, and different types of flaws in the brain. And that means that 80% of the time, we are irrational beings. So this is a totally different model than the rational agent. And we have to take that into consideration when we work with the gaming behavior. So that still leaves us a bit like this. Well, okay, that's fine. So now we have a different model, but so what? What can we do? Well, what we should be working with is to find ways to get people and customers to move from being in the hot state of mind to the cold state of mind. That is kind of the task we're facing here. 
how do we ensure that they move from being extremely hot to being cold and reflected at the right time? Moving from irrational behavior to rational behavior. And doing it at the right time, because the time is crucial here. So it's not about getting uh, customers not to participate, not to spend money, not to interact. It's just about getting them to step out of the hot state of mind at the right time, before they reach that state, or before they get out of control, or before they have a feeling that they're spending more than they intended to. And there's going to be different intentions. So, of course, these type of solutions should be flexible according to what kind of ambitions you come in with. But this is all about helping customers to follow their good ambitions on an everyday basis and going to casinos. So the good thing is that the tools are really close to us and we have a lot to work with because the tools are here or actually there with you because they're in the casinos and in the design of the interfaces of the online casinos, in the layout of the offline casinos. It's all about working with the surroundings so that it complies with our hot or cold state of mind and building in mechanisms that helps us move from being hot to cold. And that can be done in our surroundings and in the design of that. So, in order to do that, we need some strategies. And here are three strategies that are very useful if you want to ensure responsible gaming. So the first strategy is about access and default. I'm going to get into what that means. The next strategy is about giving visual directions at the right time. The final strategy is about working with the social norm, which I get an impression that you have been working with already, so that's going to be super interesting to see how that worked. But let me explain what I mean. Because now I'm just going to jump to a different arena, because as I said, I haven't done experiments in a casino yet, but I've done experiments on other arenas. A couple of years ago, we did an experiment in a Danish opera house, where the challenge was to get customers going to the opera house to improve their habits when eating at the opera house. Basically, ensuring that they would eat a lot more fruit than cake. This was beneficial to the customers, because they wanted a healthy lifestyle but it was also beneficial to the restaurant of the Opera House because this was the cheaper choice. So what we worked with was access and default settings. Mm. At the time of choice where you were supposed to choose between cake or fruit, there was a certain layout to that. They had a buffet set up where the brownies, which in this case was what we tested on, was placed in front on the buffet. It was in big pieces, and the apples were in the back, and they were whole. So what happens a lot of the time when we work with human behavior is that we overlook tiny little barriers that has a huge effect on our behavior. And it's about taking away those barriers to improve behavior, basically. So what we did, was we increased access of the right choice, which was the apples, and we reduced the size of the cakes, which is changing the default settings, meaning that... And then we took away one barrier that keeps us from eating apples when we're in the opera house, because 
we don't want to eat an apple when we go to the opera house because that's going to leave us drooling, that's going to leave us with that thing in our hand in the end. And those type of barriers are actually the ones that affect our behavior on an everyday basis. So, let me go back to this one. This is the final layout of the buffet. So we put the cakes in the back, cut them in half, so the default setting was smaller. The thing is, we have a flaw in our brain, which is called a unit bias. Th this means that we just eat a unit. So the size of the unit determines how much we eat. So by changing the default setting of a cake, we made the unit smaller, which meant that the customers would eat less sugar. We took away the barriers of eating the apple and increased the axis of the apples by placing them in front and cutting them in pieces. This increased the amount of apples that were eaten at the Danish Opera House by 84%, and it reduced the amount of cake that was eaten by 30% as well. So this is an example of working with access and default settings. And the reason why I bring out this case is because I've noticed that you already work with that in casinos. Because you're very good at creating direct access to credit. So what I mean by that is when you sit at a table and you can um, keep getting access to, to keep gambling, that's a way of working with access. And when you go to an online casino site and the button that says bed or play now is really big and visual, that is creating access to a certain behavioral pattern. So let me move on to the next strategy that you can work with. Because that is giving visual direction. That is a very powerful tool that can be used on so many different arenas and have a huge effect. But for this, I'm just going to need you guys as well. So if I can get you all to put up your hand like this. And in a second, I'm going to switch the slide. And what I would like you to do is point in the direction that the sign says. OK, you ready? I'm going to move away. So get ready to point. Um, there is something happening in our heads when we see this. So basically what is going on in our brains is that our impulses, which is what I also call the hot state, you're not hot right now, but you know, that impulse way of thinking is visually based. So the first thing we do is that we follow visual directions. Secondly, we start reading, oh, OK, it said something else. When we work with responsible gaming, this is the kind of tools that we can use as well. Being visual, give directions at the right time. I have a case where we use this. This is on a totally different arena as well, but um, it actually kind of fits into your universe as well. I got a challenge last year uh, at the Danish Central Station in Copenhagen. They had a huge problem with uh, cigarette butts in front of the entrance areas. And um, they wanted me to reduce the amount of cigarette butts being left on the ground. It created a super bad customer experience, but it was also very expensive to collect all the cigarette butts. So what we did is we created a baseline test where we collected 8,000 cigarette butts in seven days in front of the central station. And the choice architecture, which is the surroundings of the central station at that time, only had one direction in front of the central station, which was a written sign saying, throw your cigarette butts in the bins. But nevertheless, there were 8,000 cigarette butts in front of the uh, station. So what we did was we took away that sign, and then we added visual directions instead. This is just from the test scenario, and this is done with duct tape and little stickers and stuff like that. So 
we added a really clear visual indication of where are you supposed to smoke right now. We added a solution, a bin to put in your cigarette butts, which is crucial when you want people to do the right thing. And then again, visual signs and cues giving people direction. And then we counted cigarette butts again. And it turned out that we reduced the amount of cigarette butts in the wrong areas, which is outside of the bins, by 30%. And then you can go, well, okay, so that's funny or you know, interesting. What can you use this for? Well, the central station in Copenhagen Airport used this to actually create evidence-based decisions, meaning that since this test was done, they implemented these kind of smoking areas on a permanent basis on tra train stations all over Denmark. Because now they had a test to base their decisions on. Anyway, back to casinos. You already use this. You're super good at giving visual directions. So before coming here, I have been to casinos as well, but I did like intensively search on casinos, and what I found is that you are super visual. You work with leading the way to the right tables. You work with giving visual directions on the tables and on, in the online spaces as well, directing people in certain directions. So, this is the final uh, strategy that you can use when changing human behavior, which is called the social norm, social proof. Um, but it's all about working with our pack mentality. Because hot behavior is impulse-driven, it's driven by our basic instincts. And one of our most powerful instincts is the pack mentality. We're pack animals, meaning that we copy each other and we follow what everybody else around us does. So I don't know if you've tried coming into an airport where you've never been before. And then you know somehow that you're going to find a gate that is on your right side. But when you get out and everybody else is going left, then the odds that you're just going to follow them are really, really big, unless you have a barrier that's keeping you from following them. So our pack mentality overrules knowledge, motivation, opinions, and strategies. This is another experiment we did, where the task was to improve hygiene. And by this, I meant we had to do a test where we had to get more people to wash their hands after toilet visits. We work a lot in these kind of areas, which you can see. Um, but it's a lot of fun. You learn a lot about human behavior. So when you do these kind of tests, you got to figure out how do I map this behavior? How do I find out what actually goes on? In this case, we were standing outside a bunch of toilets, counting how many people are walking in and out. We were weighing the soap, and we, we were weighing how much soap comes out when you do like one pump. And all of those data we collected, and then we analyzed what happened. So it turned out that in this case, which was an experiment done on 1,500 people, it was only 44%, both women and men, who washed their hands after toilet visits. Which the consequences of that is sick days, you know, you can just imagine what, what kind of germs we have on our hands. But anyway, what we did was that we tested a piece of social proof to improve this. So in the toilets, we put up this element. And it's in Danish, but I'm going to translate. So basically what this is, is a picture of a pack doing a, the right thing. They're doing like this. They look like that because the customers we were experimenting on were dressed like that. So we're imitating their pack. And down here is a visual direction, and then it says, we wash our hands with soap. So we added that element, and then we kept counting. 
And what happened was the amount of men who started washing their hands with soap after toilet visits went up by 12%. And the amount of women washing their hands with soaps went up by 52%. So this social element had a bigger effect on women than men, which is interesting and which I wouldn't have guessed. But um, nevertheless, I'm pretty sure some brain scientists can explain why that is. But what's interesting about this is working with the social norm. And you do that as well. So whenever you have machines going pling, plong, 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 when you have a winning or they light up or something, that is actually showing a social behavior in a casino context. So you're showing other gamers or gamblers that someone is winning and it can be you. And you display winners as well. But hey, so you're actually using all these strategies already. But that's where we got to stop and go, well, OK, so wait a minute. What is the problem even? Like, why are we here? Because you're already using these strategies, and you're using them very efficiently. Well, that is also what is causing the problem, because you're very good at using these tools. And that means that we never get to leave the hot state of mind. So by staying in that impulse-driven behavior, that's going to keep us follow one path only. And that's not going to leave customers to stop and become cold and make reflective, rational choices based on what was my ambition when I came. But they're going to be left in a hot state and just rolling. And this is where we see the situations that might not be what the customers wanted when they entered. So if I have to give my point of view on what designing responsible gaming is about, it's about using these strategies that you master very well, but use them differently and doing add-ons. I'm not saying that you should change the whole strategy of how the casino world works, because that is also why we are gamers, and that's also why we come to get that experience and that excitement. But it's just starting to be aware of how do we use these strategies, and how do we use them in time and space? And how do we use them regarding to moving from a hot state of mind to a cold state of mind, because you guys are actually the choice architects that determines when the customers should be in a hot state of mind and a cold state of mind. So every design choice we make when it comes to um, defining colors, systems, interventions, sounds, lights, um, everything that surrounds this gaming experience, that is what decides whether we are going to be hot or cold. And you are in charge of that. So mm, tomorrow we're going to get a bit more into, well, how do we actually do that? What are the different steps? How do we map behavior? Because of course, doing this, you need to know what is actually going on. The good thing about um, your industry is that you have access to a lot of data. So it's pretty easy, I would assume, to drag out data and figure out what is actually going on right now. Where do people right now move from hot to cold stages? And how can we help them do it just two seconds before or two seconds later, depending on what kind of target behaviors we have? Let me just make sure. I So 
It's about getting to know these different situations. What is going on around this situation where we end up spending more than we intended to? And maybe end up spending everything we have and selling our families and houses and stuff like that. I'm not assuming that happens too often. But if we want to start working with this, we got to map out these situations. We got to get to know them. We got to get to know the interaction patterns around it. What happens? Do you normally lose three times and then once you've lost the fifth time, you are so much over your own budget that there is no turning back. Um, so that is the first step. Getting to know the situations where we get out of control. What triggers that? What happens just before and what goes on after that? Let me just get some water. Because by getting to know these situations, we can also define what are the barriers that's keeping us from being successful in the ambitions that we came with, which is staying within our budget, whatever that is, and having a good time. A lot of people coming in. Are there more? <laughs> no? Okay, awesome. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, so some of the strategies that you're already using, we can do add-ons and figure out, well, there are more people coming in. Hey, welcome. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> so we can actually use them in a different way to create different results sometimes. Not every time, of course, which is going to be totally against the nature of your industry. But we can figure out, well, instead of the Apple experiment, where I took away barriers, then we can figure out, well, how can we add barriers? Because the whole problem here is that 80% of the time, we are driven by impulses and instincts which means that access is everything. We're not in control of, or we are very bad at restraining ourselves. So how much access you create around the um, irresponsible choice, that's going to determine what we end up doing. So just like little examples, like putting in barriers when we are at a table, so that we can't just keep on gambling. So that we gotta physically move out of the place, walk 10 to 15 steps before we can sit down again. That's gonna help us move out of the hot state of mind into a cold state of mind. And of course, there's a lot of areas where this could apply. And I don't know enough about your industry to kind of point out the exact right places, but the whole strategy is switching the amount of access to building in barriers, helping us to get out of that hot state for just a little second so that we become cold and we make reflective and rational choices. Then, the whole idea of giving feedback. So right now, when we get feedback from uh, slot machines, for example, it's going to be blink, 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 blink every time someone wins. That's a certain kind of feedback, giving feedback on a winning behavior. But what if we started giving feedback on budget limits as well? When have you reached your own limit? And can we build in reminder systems, waking the cold thinking at the right time? So there are experiments in this field done in various areas where we do pop-up things. We do um, built-in barriers, for example, in computers when you want to erase your files. You get a little sign saying, are you sure you want to empty the trash bin right now? That's a barrier and a feedback mechanism keeping us from doing something stupid or something that doesn't comply with our, our ambitions. 
And we can build in mechanisms like that as well, whether it's online or offline. But doing feedback mechanisms on how far or close are you to your budget limit. And then display another social norm. Display the social norm of not necessarily the spenders, but the people who are actually able to move out of the hot state of mind and into the cold and stay within their budget. And it sounds like you have been giving feedback mechanisms as well on various um, data. So that's going to be exciting to hear about. But so you see how it's, so how it's not about doing a completely different thing. It's about using the mechanisms that you use already and getting as close to the decision making as possible and helping customers get out of the hot state of mind at the exact right time and doing it without killing the party, of course, because they are there to have fun, they are there to, be, to experience the rush and to be hot. You just got to make sure that by the time that we know they're crossing a line where it's not fun anymore, that's where we get them out of the hot state and into the cold. Because then the assumption <laughs> is that we're going to get a long-term relationship, long-term loyalty and satisfaction. Because if they experience that you actually provided the service that helped them comply with their own ambitions, which was both having fun spending money but also stopping at the right time, then that's going to increase satisfaction and make them come back. And what you're actually doing is making life as a gambler a lot easier. Because you're making it fun to just relax and lean back because you guys have made sure that they're going to stay within their limits and get out of there and be super happy, happy and having a fun experience, getting the rush of being hot, but still being able to step out of that and become cold when it's necessary. And that's actually all for me. So. <laughs>